even though I write things down as reminders, I forget them, and then I don't do them, so I have to do them later. So I was supposed to do this during prayer time, but I'm going to add it on now. Uh, those of you who've been here for a while know that on occasion we do 40 days of prayer and fasting for individuals, and we're going to enter into a time of prayer and fasting beginning tomorrow, Monday, September 28th, for our sister Rose Vrabel, who is heading for heart surgery uh, on Tuesday. And it's very simple. We, we ask you if you would be so kind to, to pray for her for 24 hours and fast for her. Now, I know some of you have diabetic issues that you, you can't quite do 24 hours without food, and that, that's okay. You can fast from the television. You can fast from the Internet. Uh, but most of you could fast from food, and that will, will prompt you to pray. When you're hungry for food, it prompts you to pray more. And so I would just invite you, if you've never done it before, many of you have done it many times. Uh, some of you even take multiple days or multiple days in a row. And I would encourage you to, to do this, first because we love Rose, but also because it's a good spiritual discipline to fast and to pray. And so I just wanted to let you know that this sign-up sheet will be up here after the service. If you would like to sign up, that would be great. End of prayer time, beginning of sermon time. Let's pray. Lord, more of you and less of me. Through Christ I come. Amen. But well, we're going to be exploring a little bit of what revenge is today. And I thought I'd give you a little lighter word on revenge before we tackle our sermon. Jack's mother ran into the bedroom when she heard him scream and found his two-year-old sister pulling his hair. She gently released the little girl's grip and said comfortingly to Jack, There, there. She didn't mean it. She didn't know that it hurts. <laughs> Mother was barely out of the room when the little girl screamed. Rushing back in, she said, Jack, what happened? And Jack simply smiled and said, now she knows. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you've been there. Welcome back to our series in the Wild West of the Bible, Judges. As we encounter what, what, I, what I term in Judges, uh, we're going to explore two of the Judges in this wild little book. One I would term a, a bit of a jerk, and we are deep in the middle of his set of five. This is message number three. And then we're going to move into a jewel from Judges, a judge who, who truly was a jewel in many respects. But for now... We are in message number three of five on the man known as Samson. And just a little bit of review. He was affectionately known from the first message. Do you remember? Uh, we affectionately knew him as little what? Son. Little son or little sunshine. The name Samson means little son. Well, last week, little Sonny grew up, didn't he? And he started dating. And he got married for a week, if you recall. And this drama illustrates our point of last week. Do you remember what that was? That we should never underestimate the value of? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You better be careful. I have, next, I have last week's sermon still in my bag. I might have to preach it again. Do you remember? Never underestimate the value of a... Who just said bad example? Caden, thank you. Never underestimate the value of a bad example. So continuing on that theme of badness, let me give you today's point. On your sermon notes, under the burning brute, Judges 15, 1 to 20, uh, it's very simple. Don't do the bad others do to you. Just, just don't do the bad others do to you. 
if that sounds mildly familiar. It's an inversion of the golden rule that Jesus gave us in the Gospels, interestingly. Samson quotes the opposite essence of Jesus' golden rule in our text today. Not only does Samson quote it, but the Philistines themselves quote it. Samson is a tragic figure that truly proves, in case you ever wondered, that God really can use anyone to accomplish his purposes. But the level of deadly drama goes over the top this week. I want you to grab your Bibles, turn to Judges 15. If you forgot your Bible, you walked out this morning and you were so blown away. The beauty of fall coming upon you that you left it in the car or you left it at home. We have Bibles stationed at the ends of the pews. They're there for you to use. We love it when God's people open up his word. I'm in Judges chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. You can follow along if you want to. Today we'll see Samson trying to start over. As with all tragic characters, there tends to be that moment where they try to go back. They try to make it right. And they're rejected. Now we're going to see things go from bad to burning. Let's read chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. Later on, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. I was so sure you thoroughly hated her, he said, that I gave her to your friend. Isn't your younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Okay, a little, little caveat. Did I mention that there's drama in Judges? Okay, let's continue on. Samson said to them, this time, I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails. He lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and the standing grain together with the vineyards and the olive groves. When the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told, Samson. The Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his friend. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. On your fill-in, you need to know today that no one ever actually gets even. No one. No one ever actually gets even. You might say, you know what, I'm going to go get even. You never get even. It always drips a little over the edge. It always adds a little more than you thought you would, and then you get some back. No one ever gets even. Samson came back to try and make things right, didn't he? But it was too late. His reaction to the rejection is an act of vandalism. That's hard to imagine. We don't know how he did it. Okay? I don't want you any kids going home trying to tie your cat's tails together and doing anything crazy. You're not Samson. You don't want to be Samson. We don't know how he did it. We don't even know how long it took for him to do it. But we do know that he did it. And the devastation would have been shocking. You see the wheat crop? If you burn up the wheat crop, it's seasonal, okay? The wheat crop would have come back next year. But then the wheat crop caught, and then it was close to the vineyards, and then the vineyards caught on fire. The vineyards take decades to grow. They take decades to develop and grow till you can get a good crop of grapes. But then, you see, after the wheat caught on fire, then it spread to the vineyards, then it spread to the olive groves. Olive trees can be over a hundred years old. Did you know that? They can grow and grow and be so old and, and Samson burned them up too. So this was over the top. 
It was a crime of passion. Ever heard that term? Crimes of passion. People that do stuff because they were rejected by a lover, a husband, or a wife. This is costly and insulting. And the response is also very deadly. We see, we see here Philistines killing Philistines. Remember? Samson's wife was a Philistine. Now the Philistines go and they kill her and her family. Remember last week, uh, Samson threatened, or they threatened Samson's wife and family because of a riddle. Now they follow through. You remember? She was given away to another man. Remember that? She was given away to Samson's friend. Where, where was he? <laughs> Did he get all burned up too? He, he got a free wife a couple, couple weeks before, and now he's caught in a fire. Uh, several years ago, I, I preached about how sin splatters. The sin will get on you. If you hang around with sinful people, you're not doing anything real sinful. But it gets on you because of the proximity. This is why, back to the crimes of passion, policemen always tell me that they're always extremely wary of domestic disputes because of how nasty people who know each other and love each other, love each other, can, can get. And it can get bad. Application question. When you're deeply offended, how do you respond? How do you respond? Do you think, ooh, now, now I have a reason to get them. Now I have a reason to get back. And so the revenge cycle begins. And we're going to see it really start whipping in Samson's life. But you need to know that when, we're, when you're rejected, that can also be injected into you, that, that spirit, that sense that I need to get revenge on you. And then that cycle will accelerate and increase. But now let's watch that cycle of revenge start in Samson's life and really get spinning in verses 7 through 13. Verses 7 through 13. Samson said to them, Since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Etom. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lahai. The men of Judah asked, Why have you come to fight us? We have come to take Samson prisoner, they answered. To do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock at Edom and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, We've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two ropes and led him up from the rocks. And this is a little sign sermon that's been out on 585. Revenge restrained is victory gained. Revenge restrained is actually victory gained. Uh, who, who did Samson attack? I wonder who, who he attacked. Maybe his fellow arsonists? Okay. Remember, he, he started the burning. Then they said, oh yeah, you burn us, we're going to burn you. Samson is all about getting what he deserves. Remember what he says? Now I'm going to get my what? I'm going to get my revenge. He ends up, again, we, we, find, we find Samson, again, all alone, in a cave. The cycle of revenge isolates in the end. Now, the Philistines seek to put pressure on the people of Judah. So they bring out their army. And the men of Judah say, hey, 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 what, 
What's up? What's going on? What's at the mil military buildup here at the DMZ? Why you got, why you guys rattling your sabers at us? And look, look real hard at the last part of verse 10. To do to him as he, what? Three words. Did to us. Oh. And then if you fast forward down to the last part of 11, Judah asked Samson the same question. And they get, he gets the same answer. Oh, I'm just doing to them what they did to me. They hit me first. She pulled my hair first. Does this sound relatively familiar to anybody? Uh, they did it first. Well, who, who started it? Well, but they did it first. Folks, the cycle of revenge is nasty. This is even more reason. If I can just drop a little bit of Jesus into the equation. Ooh, this is why Jesus had to come and give us the golden rule. To turn Samson's revenge rule into the golden rule. Do unto others what you would have them do to you. It's proactive. Stop the cycle of revenge. Two wrongs do not make a right. Now I believe here would have been another opportunity in this story. Just holding with the Old Testament line. Okay, God wanted to find a reason for Israel, for Judah to push back on the Philistines. Here was another opportunity. God is prompting Judah, his people, to stand up against their oppressors and rescue a native son. Now, I'm going to put this disclaimer on. What Samson did wasn't right. Okay? He was being all nasty. He was concerned about himself. But the, the men of Judah could have stood up and said, hold on. That's our boy. That's our boy, Samson. You're not just going to come in here and get him. But they chose to say, no, huh. we'll give you to him. We'll give him to you. Hold on, just wait a minute. So they chose the easy way out and turned Samson over to the killers. Do you notice that verse? There's sadness in Samson's voice. I believe it's the end of 12. Samson says, swear to me, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Samson can't even trust his own people, first off, to tell the truth, and second, not to just kill him and turn over the dead body. There's sadness there. Friends, application question. Have you ever been caught in a cycle of revenge? How did you get out of it? That'd be a great one to talk about over Sunday lunch. How somebody did you wrong, and then you did back to them, and then they did to you. And then you realize maybe the Holy Spirit came into your, came into your life, came into your heart, and said, oh, 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 I got to stop this before it goes completely crazy. How did you do it? How did it happen? Were you able to reconcile? Were you able to make peace? The deeper question is, if you're in a cycle of revenge right now, they got me, now I'm going to get them. Now they're getting me again. Now I got to get... When are you going to stop it? When's the cycle of revenge going to come to an end for you? Or will it end up when your own people turn you over. <laughs> How will it end? When will it end? We're going to finish out with verses 14 through 20. We're going to finish out one, chap one more chapter of this sad story. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him, shouting. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, 
with a donkey's jawbone. I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramath Lehi. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord. You've given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi. And water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. So the spring was called En-Hakor. And it's still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Finally, even He-Man gets humbled. How many people remember He-Man? Remember He-Man in cartoons? He never got humbled, did he? He-Man was He-Man. He was big. He was tough. But in the Bible, the He-Man, God's He-Man, always gets humbled. I don't know if you think you're He-Man today. If you think you're He-Man, can I, can I just remind you that you will get humbled just like Samson does. This is the battle that made him a legend. This is the battle that immortalized the donkey's jawbone as the Jewish Jedi's lightsaber. Okay, all the stories about Samson, all the stuff you hear about the jawbone of a donkey comes right from that story right there. The carnage is stunning, but so is the cockiness. Everyone loves a winner until they start to brag. Samson's saying, ha ha, look what I did. I imagine he tossed that jawbone like an arrogant NFL player would spike the football and say, ha, I won. Look at me. But there wasn't nobody waiting with a can of Gatorade for Samson. He was all alone again. The euphoria of the victory wears off and he realizes that he's alone in a blood-soaked, arid place. He needs water, but where can he get it? And so the strong man cries out and says, he needs help because he's not God. Don't, don't miss how the tone changes. Don't miss how he says, you, you, Lord, have given your servant victory. That's a powerful proclamation, considering the little, little uh, poem that he gave us right before that. Has God ever brought you to that place? Has God ever brought you to a place, maybe even after a stunning victory in your life, after a stunning uh, accomplishment. Has God ever brought you to the point that you ask uh, yourself that, that application question, have you ever been made vividly aware that you are not God? I can't even imagine what Samson would have felt like. Had all them people coming at him, he wipes them out. He'd have, he'd have felt pretty powerful, wouldn't he? It's the same temptation that we face. But then we get thirsty we exert all that effort and energy and we realize that we can't self-revive. We can't self-give ourselves what we need. Samson's arrogant little poem turns into a whimper for water. I wonder, how has God humbled you? Or does he need to right now? Oh, friends, don't do, please, don't, don't do the bad to others that they do to you. Because no one actually ever gets even. Because the revenge cycle only increases and accelerates. That's why revenge restrained is victory gained. Is there, is there a spirit of vengeance in your life that you need to let go of before it goes out of control? You better. Or you could come up with a day just like Samson had, fresh from the fight, but bone dry on the inside, 
Will you humble yourself? Maybe that's even you today. Don't do the bad. Embrace the rule of Jesus that says, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. God is waiting for you to cry out because only God can give you the living water that can revive you. And he'll do it even today. Let us pray. Oh, Lord. This is a tragic story. We see that you used it. We see that you used this flawed man, Samson, to liberate your people. But it came at a, at a tremendous price to Samson himself. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to be Samson's. We don't have to make the same mistakes that he did in accomplishing your purposes. We thank you that you sent Jesus to be the true strong man and the one that we seek to follow. Oh, Lord, if there are those here today that need your humbling to happen, I pray that it would. And I pray that even in this quiet moment, we would cry out to you and we would ask you to give us your living water, to refresh and revive us. Oh Lord, we do ask this all in your name. Amen.